everyone. So today we'll discuss the part three of the crash course of physiology, and today we'll discuss about the topic excretory system. So first of all, what are the non-excretory functions of the kidney? So it includes first of all the homeostatic function. Kidneys maintain the constancy of the internal environment of the body by regulating the volume and the composition of the extracellular fluid via the conservation or excretion of the water and solutes. Now kidneys have the following endocrine functions. Firstly, it secretes the renin. Renin is the major component of the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism that helps to regulate the blood pressure. Now next is the renal erythropoiety. Now if you remember uh, in, in our blood chapter, we discuss about this in the blood part that hypoxia causes the releasing of the erythropoietin from the kidney which promotes the erythropoiesis. Now next is the dihydroxycholic calciferol. Now how this is formed from the kidney? So look at this. First of all, whatever you eat, whatever vitamin D supplements you have is converted to hydroxycholic calciferol. And then in the presence of one alpha hydroxylase enzyme in the kidney uh, proximal convoluted tubules, this enzyme, this particular hydroxylase enzyme is present in the kidney. Okay, in the kidney PCT, proximal convoluted tubules. So in the presence of this enzyme, this hydroxycholic calciferol is converted to dihydroxycholic calciferol, which is the biologically most active form of vitamin D. Now next function is the gluconeogenic function. The kidney acquires the important ability to synthesize and secrete the glucose produced from the non-carbohydrate sources in the abnormal situations like prolonged starvation. So these were the non-excretory function of kidney. Now next is the renin angiotensin system. Now this system comprises a protease hormone that is renin which is produced by the kidneys and also a circulating peptide that is the angiotensin. Now as you can see over here in this picture, the JG cell, the juxtaglomerular apparatus, the JG apparatus secretes the renin hormone and this is present in the kidney. Right? In the kidney, this particular apparatus is present. Now this particular, uh, this renin acts on a circulating glycoprotein in a globulin fraction of the plasma protein known as the angiotensinogen. Now this renin acts on this angiotensinogen and converts this angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 okay now this angiotensin 1 is physiologically inactive okay now this angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 by the action of angiotensin converting enzyme and this enzyme is located in the endothelial cells in various tissues but most of the conversion occurs in the lungs this angiotensin 2 is physiologically active substance. So now what are the functions done by this angiotensin 2? Firstly, this angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor and causes the vasoconstriction. So let's uh, look at the theoretical part. Angiotensin 2 actions. It is a potent vasoconstrictor and brings about an increment in the systolic as well as diastolic blood pressure and brings about an increment in the systolic as well as diastolic blood pressure. So that's why this angiotensin 2 causes the increment in the blood pressure. Now next function is it stimulates the releasing of the aldosterone. Okay, because it acts on the adrenal cortex and because it acts on the adrenal cortex, it stimulates the releasing of the aldosterone. Also facilitates the releasing of the norepinephrine from the postganglionic sympathetic ganglion. Also, it causes the contraction of the mesangial cells in the kidney and that's why they cause decrement in the GFR that is the glomerular filtration rate because it causes contraction of the mesangial cell. It causes decrement in the GFR. They cause increment in the water intake by acting on the thirst center in the brain and they regulate the ECF volume. So, these were the action of the angiotensin 2 as angiotensin 2 is physiologically active substance. Now next is the regulation of the renin angiotensin system. So intrarenal baroreceptor mechanism. When the intraarterial pressure at the level of JG cells, juxtaglomerular cells is decreased, renin secretion is increased and vice versa occurs. Renin secreting cells themselves act as a baroreceptor, very important. Cells of the macular densa sense the amount of sodium and the chlorine ions in the filtrate Reaching the distal tubules, an amount of renin secreted is inversely proportional to the sodium and the chlorine ions. That is, decrement 
in the amount of sodium and chlorine reaching this part of nephron stimulates the renin secretion this line is very important this particular line okay the amount of angiotensin 2 controls the renin secretion by the negative feedback mechanism by direct action on the jg cells vasopressin also inhibits the renin secretion so this is how the regulation of the renin angiotensin system occurs not only this but also the renal sympathetic nerves regulates the renin angiotensin system how because the regulation by constricting the efferent arterioles and decreases the intra arterial pressure it stimulates the intra renal baroreceptors and controls the renin secretion by direct stimulating via the beta 1 adrenergic receptors on the renin secreting granular cells direct effect is more sensitive the renin secretion is promoted by certain stimuli like sodium depletion hypotension hemorrhage dehydration cardiac failure liver cirrhosis and the psychological stimuli these all promotes the renin secretion now the very important topic that is the duxta globerular apparatus till now we discussed that uh, this particular apparatus causes releasing of the renin and all okay but what is this apparatus actually okay so duxta globerular apparatus is a complex present in the kidney over here it now what does this apparatus includes over here this apparatus firstly includes the component the main component that is the juxta glomerular cell so as you can see over here this three the apparatus this apparatus consists of these three important components components so over here as you can see this is the jg cells this is the macula densa the part of the distal convoluted tubule this macula densa is a part of the dct and this is the mesangial cell this mesangial cells are over here also over here these are also the mesangial cells this yellow part this yellow cells are also the mesangial cells and this coming over here this is the mesangial cell involved in the jg apparatus so this is the macula densa part of the dct this is the jg cells now what is the jg cells first of all jg cells are specialized epithelial cells present in the tunica media of the efferent arteriole this is the efferent this is the efferent so this is the efferent so these are the specialized epithelial cells present in the tunica media of the efferent arteriole now next is the macula densa as i told you before also that this is the part of the dct epithelial cells of the dct so a modified region of the tubular epithelium of the distal tubule where it touches the arterioles of the glomerulus from which the tubule has originated and it is in close proximity to the jg cells as you can see over here okay this is the macula densa and third is the lesser cells also known as the mesangial cells this, these are the mesangial cells so mesangial cells are located in the triangular space bounded by the efferent and the efferent arterioles as you can see over here and also they are bounded uh, by the macula densa so triangle in the triangular region that means efferent arteriole efferent arteriole and the macula densa and the triangle formed between these three structures over here the mesangial cells or the lacy cells are present okay now, the, the, now this jg complex this complex over here secretes the renin and plays an important role in the regulation of the what 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 blood pressure okay so this three important components over here jg cells macula densa and the lesser cell or the mesangial cells now one question for you why there is albuminuria in the nephritis so comment me this answer and i will give you the answer of this question in the in my next video description box so till now think about this answer and comment me down now next is the mechanism of the urine formation what causes the formation of the urine so over here we have three main steps and the fourth is the excretion so over here the first step occurs over here that is the glomerular filtration step over here what happens water and the solutes smaller than the proteins are forced through the capillary walls as you can see these are the capillary walls this is the capillaries so they are forced through the capillary walls and the pores of the glomerular capsule into the renal tubule this is the renal tubule they are forced from the capillaries and the pores of the glomerular capsule 
into the renal tubule. So this is the glomerular filtration step. Now next is the tubular reabsorption step. Over here the water, glucose, amino acid and the needed ions are transported out of the filtrate into the tubule cells and then enter into the capillary blood. Okay, this diagram is very easy to understand. Okay, over here the tubular reabsorption occurs. What, what, what happens over here? The important ions, water, glucose, amino acid are transported out of the filtrate into the tubules and then enters the capillary blood. Now, finally the, the tubular secretion occurs over here. The hydrogen ion, potassium ion, creatinine and the drugs are removed from the peritubular blood and secreted by the tubule cells into the filtrate. So all the unwanted things, all the unwanted ions, all the un unnecessary ions and the drugs at toxicity are removed from the peritubular blood and secreted by tubule cells into the filtrate which are then excreted into the urine. Okay. This is the very important mechanism of the urine formation. Now the GFR, glomerular filtration rate. It is the volume of the glomerular filtrate formed each minute by all the nephrons in both the kidneys. This definition is very easy plus it is very important commonly asked in one or two markers in the exam. What is GFR? Okay. The next is the normal value of the GFR that is 125 milliliter per minute. It is the GFR normal range. The GFR can be determined by finding out the renal clearance of a substance which satisfies the following criteria. So, which are these criteria? Firstly, the substance should be freely filtered at the glomerulus. Also, it should not be reabsorbed in the tubules. Even it should not be secreted into the tubular lumen. It should not be metabolized in the kidney and also it should not be toxic. It should be non-toxic. Okay, and uh, one such substance that meets all of these criteria, it is the very important. It is the so one such substance that meets all the above criteria is the inulin. So remember, the inulin is not absorbed from the kidney even a single percent. That's why this inulin is used for the renal function tests also to determine the perfect GFR of a particular human body kidney. Because whatever amount of inulin you will eat, you will have in your diet will be released in the whole amount from the body. It will be directly excreted from the body. It is not absorbed in the kidney. Now how this inulin clearance is calculated? So it is calculated by fusing it at a steady rate and maintaining its concentration in the blood. It is then determined by the particular this equation UV upon P. Okay, this equation is used to determine the inulin clearance. It is used to calculate the inulin clearance in the body and as a very important part in the renal function tests also. The value of the inulin clearance is normally is it is 125 ml per minute and if you remember the GFR normal value is also 125 ml per minute. Okay, now next it is the filtration fraction. Filtration fraction is the ratio of the glomerular filtration rate to the renal plasma flow. For example, if the normal GFR in an adult is 125 ml per minute and the renal blood flow is 700 ml per minute, therefore the filtration fraction will be 0.18. Okay. Normal range is around this only. Now what factors affect the GFR? So these are changes in the renal blood flow. Changes in the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular capillaries including changes in the BP and efferent or the efferent arterial constriction. Hydrostatic pressure in the Bowman's capsule also affects the GFR. Changes in the concentration of the plasma protein. State of the glomerular membrane. The size of the capillary bed. Now what is facultative reabsorption of a substance in the kidney? Now this means there is variable reabsorption of a substance occurring in the kidney according to the body requirement. For example, if a human body requires uh, water, okay, there is they are suffering from dehydration. So what the body will do? Over here the kidney will 
under the influence of the antidiuretic hormone it will cause reabsorption of the water in the collecting ducts and this adh facilitates the water reabsorption by increasing the permeability of the tubular epithelial cells to the water this particular reabsorption results in the concentration of urine and hypertonic urine is excreted facultative reabsorption of water varies according to the body needs if the fluid intake is excess reabsorption is decreased and vice versa occurs so if the body is having excess water so what the kidney kidneys will do it will excrete the water and will inhibit the reabsorption okay and vice versa occurs this is achieved through the regulation of the antidiuretic hormone secretion so this particular hormone plays a vital role over here now glucose reabsorption in the kidneys the renal threshold for the glucose is the plasma level at which the glucose first appear in the urine in more than the normal minute amounts so the predicted value of this is around 300 mg per deciliter but the actual renal threshold corresponds to 200 mg per dl of the arterial plasma and 180 of the venous blood the actual threshold renal threshold is less than the predicted value for the two reasons which are these two reasons first as you can see over here this is the predicted value and this is the actual value 200 predicted value is more and actual is less and this is for two reasons very important commonly asked in the exams the ideal curve would be seen if the transport maximum for the glucose in all the tubules were identical which uh, in the human case doesn't occurs doesn't happens also if all the glucose were removed from each tubule when the amount filter was less than the transport maximum for the glucose now this is not the case in the humans in the humans this thing doesn't occurs that's why the actual curve is somewhat round this is the predicted one that doesn't occurs in the humans this tmg the transport maximum for glucose it should be identical in all the tubules okay and this is the splay what is splay that means the this is the actual curve which is rounded and deviates considerably from the ideal curve which is known as splay this is the splay the actual curve not the predicted one that doesn't occurs in the humans now the magnitude of this splay is inversely proportional to the avidity with which the transport mechanism binds the substance it transports so that's why at plasma glucose level of 220 mg per dl around renal threshold for glucose is crossed and it appears in the urine because if you remember the predicted uh, threshold level was 300 but the actual is 200 so if the plasma glucose level uh, is 220 the glucose will cross the limits and will appear in the urine now what mechanisms regulates the sodium excretion so remember sodium is the main ion present in the extracellular fluid which determines the extracellular fluid volume so that's why number of mechanisms are present in the body to regulate its excretion so which are they gfr is regulated by tubular glomerular feedback mechanism reabsorption is governed by the glomerular tubular uh, balance circulating levels of the aldosterone also determines so circulating levels of the atrial natriuretic peptide and also renin angiotensin mechanism and even the rate of the tubular secretion of the potassium and the hydrogen these all regulate the sodium excretion because sodium is one of the important ions which determines the ecf volume in the body now the regulation of the glomerular filtration now how the filtration is regulated so over here it occurs due to the presence of the intra renal auto regulatory mechanism these mechanisms are auto regulatory depending on the needs these mechanisms basically regulate the renal blood uh, flow and cons and consequently the glomerular capillary pressure and the gfr is also regulated by them following are the probable auto regulatory mechanism for the renal blood flow which includes the myogenic mechanism and the tubular glomerular feedback mechanism again a important question now what is the mechanism of the myogenic auto regulation a very easy 
flow chart is given over here about the mechanism of such. Whenever the arterial blood pressure is increased, there is increment in the efferent arterial blood pressure also. And this causes the increment in the arterial wall stretching because of the increment in the blood pressure. And this stretching of this arterial wall will increase the sensing by the myogenic stress receptors. That's why this is known as a myogenic autoregulation because this will cause increment in the sensing by the myogenic stretch receptors. Now what will happen now? This will increase the opening of the voltage gated calcium channels and this further will cause increment in the influx of the calcium from the ECF to the vascular smooth muscle cells and further will cause increment in the contraction of the vascular smooth muscle cells and further will cause vasoconstriction. Now because of the vasoconstriction occurring over here, what will happen? As we all know in the kidney, we have efferent as well as efferent arterioles. And because of this vasoconstriction, what will happen? This will cause increment in the resistance in the efferent arterioles in the kidney. And because of the increment in the resistance in the arterioles in the kidney, in the efferent one, this will cause decrement in the changes in the efferent arterial blood flow. And because of this, there will be decrement in the changes in the GFR and GFR is maintained. Now, opposite thing occurs if the arterial blood pressure is decreased. If there is decrement in the arterial blood pressure, the GFR is again maintained. How? Because over here, what will happen? There will be vasodilation. And because of this, there will be decrement in the resistance of the arterioles. And because of this, the net filtration pressure is maintained at a constant level. Now next is the tubular glomerular feedback mechanism. Now over here the main sensor it is the macula densa. Macula densa cells of the distal tubules are the main sensor over here. Now what happens? The cells of the macula densa senses the load of the chloride or maybe sodium ions present in the filtrate and causes the releasing of the renin and subsequently angiotensin 2 will be formed. Okay. Now, this angiotensin 2, what, what it will do? The main function of it, it is the vasoconstriction. And this angiotensin 2 will mainly cause the vasoconstriction of the efferent arteriole. Okay, and then it controls the vascular resistance and subsequently the glomerular filtration is also regulated. It is also controlled. Now, next, it is the obligatory water reabsorption. In the proximal convoluted tubules, the passive reabsorption of 60 to 70 percent of the water occurs along the osmotic gradient set by the active transport of the solutes. Passive reabsorption of the water in the PCT secondary to the active reabsorption of sodium is called as the obligatory reabsorption of the water. Aquaporin 1 over here is mainly involved. Now next is the facultative water reabsorption we discussed about this previously also. It is the reabsorption of the water under the influence of the ADH in the collecting ducts and it is done according to the need of the body. Over here aquaporin 2 is involved in the obligatory aquaporin 1 was involved. Now the counter current mechanism. The kidney has the power of producing the urine of varying osmolarity and it can produce dilute or concentrated urine depending on the body requirements or body needs. Human kidney can produce dilute urine of osmolarity between 50 milliosmoles per liter to 1200 around as compared to the normal plasma osmolarity of 250. Urine is concentrated as a result of reabsorption of the water from the tubular fluid into the medullary interstitium in the collecting ducts and the DCT under the influence of antidiuretic hormone. We discussed about this previously also, right? Reabsorption of the water occurs due to the hyperosmolarity of the medullary interstitium. This is the main line you should remember for the counter current mechanism. This hyperosmolarity of the medullary interstitium mainly regulates the counter current mechanism. In fact, an osmotic gradient exists as we go deeper from the cortex to the medulla. As we go from cortex to medulla, the osmotic gradient exists. Means there is a gradient between the 
uh, different environments over here from as you go from cortex to medulla now important thing greatest osmolarity exists in the innermost part of the medulla corresponding to the site of the renal papillae creation of the medullary osmolarity is the function of the loop of henle of the corticomedullary nephrons constituting the counter current multiplier system so as we go deeper into the medulla the gradient increases the osmotic gradient increases the hyperosmolarity is maintained due to the special features of vasa recta running close and parallel to the loop of henle constituting the counter current exchanger the elaboration of the concentrated urine thus occurs due to the presence of first the counter current multiplier counter current exchanger and the relatively low medullary renal blood flow all this operate to make the medullary interstitium hyper or smaller to cause the to concentrate the urine okay to cause the concentration of the urine anatomically collecting ducts are placed in close vicinity of the loop of henle and the vasa recta and the loop of henle makes a hairpin band at the tip of the renal papilla now how the medullary osmolarity is generated so this depends on the varying permeability due to different substances along the loop of henle which includes thick ascending limb this is the thick ascending limb so this thick ascending limb actively transports the chloride ions into the interstitium and the sodium follows it so that's for the nacl over here it is transported into the interstitium into the interstitial fluid but limited diffusion from the interstitium occurs because the thick ascending limb is relatively impermeable to water urea and nacl this descending limb is freely permeable to water and impermeable to ions and partially permeable to urea thin ascending limb this thin ascending limb is permeable to nacl somewhat permeable to urea and impermeable to water as the sodium and the chloride ions are actively transported out of the thick ascending limb hence the interstitium becomes what it becomes hyperosmolar now one more important thing in the medulla except for the ascending limb all the other structures including the descending limb interstitium as well as the collecting ducts are in osmotic equilibrium thus the descending limb acquires the hyperosmolarity of the interstitium now what is the role of the urea the transport of the urea occurs into the interstitium by the process of diffusion in the collecting ducts as they are permeable to urea and urea concentration is higher here as the amount of the filtrate decreases now this helps to create the medullary hyperosmolarity which is useful for the counter current mechanism the next is the most important topic that is steps involved in the counter current mechanism so the first step occurs over here in the thick ascending limb so first step over here the active nacl reabsorption occurs without the water in the thick ascending limb it makes the tubular fluid dilute more dilute and the interstitium concentrated okay now the second step occurs in the descending limb now the fluid in the descending limb equilibrates osmotically with the hyperosmotic interstitium because if you remember in the first step uh, because of the active nacl reabsorption without water the interstitium became concentrated it became hyperosmolar right so that's why Uh, the fluid in the descending limb tries to become equilibrium osmotically with the hyperosmotic interstitium by the movement of the water out of the tubule through the water channels that is the aquapodium that's why the water is reabsorbed over here as you can see okay by the aquapodium one channels because it because in the step 2 this descending limb is trying to Uh, uh, become equilibrium osmotically with the hyperosmotic interstitium that's why it removes the water out from the tubules and the interstitium into the interstitium from the aquaporin one channels now in the step 3 the concentrated fluid in the descending limb if you remember the step 2 because the descending limb wanted to become equilibrium with the interstitium fluid it 
uh, it causes the removal of the H2O of the water from the tubule into the interstitium to become equilibrium with the uh, interstitium. That's why the water removed from the tubules. Now, as because the water removed from the tubules, the fluid in the uh, descending limb became concentrated. Now, this concentrated fluid flows counter current up to the ascending limb where the NaCl is passively reabsorbed further concentrating the medullary interstitium. Now the step 4. As the water is reabsorbed in the cortical and the outer medullary collecting ducts, urea concentration in the tubular fluid increases. So as over here the urea concentration in the fluid tubular fluid increases, what will happen? Urea then moves passively out in the inner medullary collecting ducts into the interstitium through the vasopressin regulated urea transporters 1 and 3. And over here the urea contributes to increase the interstitial osmolarity. Now final step, step 5. Over here the vasa recta as you can see is having a hairpin configuration which is similar to the loop of Henle. And it is also in close proximity to the tubules and it plays a very important role in the maintenance of the medullary osmotic gradient by returning the NaCl and the water over here is reabsorbed to the systemic circulation. So these were the five important steps of the countercurrent mechanism. Now acidification of the urine. Chemical reactions involved in the reabsorption of the bicarbonate in the kidney. Bicarbonate reabsorption is an active process. It is accompanied by the secretion of the H plus ion as you can see in this diagram. Okay. It occurs in the proximal tubules and the collecting ducts. As you can see over here, this H2O and the CO2 in the presence of the carbonic anhydrase enzymes forms this H2CO3. And this H2CO3 is then dissociated into the bicarbonate ion and the H plus ion. Now this bicarbonate ion is reabsorbed while this H plus ion is secreted. It is secreted into the tubular lumen in the presence of ATP. Now what happens and why do the urine pH following a meal? Whenever you eat after your meal, what happens to your urine pH? So when the gastric acid secretion is increased following a meal, whenever you eat, the H plus and the HCl secretion is increased in your stomach, of course. Now sufficient H plus may be secreted to raise the bicarbonate in the gastric venous blood, which contributes a greater amount of bicarbonate to the systemic circulation and the pH of the systemic blood rises, means it becomes alkaline. And this is called as the postprandial alkaline tide, which is characterized by high pH of the urine following a meal. Now anion gap. Anion gap refers to the difference between the concentration of cations other than the sodium and anions other than the chlorine and the bicarbonates in the plasma. It includes the proteins in the anionic form that is the hydrogen phosphate and the sulfate and organic acids also. Now what is the role of the kidney in the regulation of the pH? The body remains in a steady state with respect to production of fixed acid and excretion of the H plus ions by the kidney. We, we discussed this before also, right? This H plus ion is excreted by the, body, by the kidneys and the pH is thus maintained at a constant rate. The source of fixed acid in the body is mainly the protein metabolism. H plus ions produced in the body are immediately buffered by the bicarbonate ions of the blood buffer system, resulting in the loss of bicarbonate ions which need to be restored, right? So hydrogen ions secretion by the kidneys However, has a limiting value and beyond that, no more secretion of the hydrogen ion can occur. This limiting corresponds to a unitary pH of 4.5 called as the limiting pH which can be reached rapidly and further secretion of the H plus by tubular cell will be stopped. However, certain buffer system are present in the, in the kidney to buffer these secreted hydrogen ions so that the process continues. Buffer system in the kidneys includes the bicarbonate buffer system, dibasic phosphate system and the ammonia buffer system. So this is the bicarbonate buffering system. Now next is the dibasic phosphate system or we can say phosphate buffering system 
over here in the tubular lumen Na2HPO4 breaks down into Na plus and NaHPO4 minus. This sodium is reabsorbed while uh, in exchange the hydrogen ions combine with the NaHPO4 and forms the NaH2PO4 is excreted. Now next is the ammonia buffer system. Over here, the ammonia is secreted into the tubular lumen, which combines with the H plus ion and forms the ammonia. The next is the micturition reflex. Micturition is fundamentally a spinal reflex facilitated and inhibited by the higher brain centers. And just like defecation, it is subject to voluntary facilitation and inhibition. The bladder smooth muscles have some inherent contractile activity. However, when its nerve supply is intact, the stretch receptors in the bladder wall initiate a reflex contraction that has a lower threshold than the inherent contractile response of the muscle. About 3 to 400 ml of urine in the bladder initiates a reflex contraction in the bladder due to the stimulation of the stretch receptors located in the wall of the bladder. Now what happens after the stimulation of the stress receptors? So whenever the stress receptors on the wall of the bladder are stimulated, the efferents from the stress receptors travels via the pelvic nerves up to the spinal center. And these pelvic nerves are parasympathetic. So efferents from the stress receptors travels via the pelvic nerves and up to the spinal center, right? Now the efferents, so efferents via the pelvic nerves causes the contraction of the detrusor muscle and will cause relaxation of the internal urethral sphincter. Now over here remember the external urethral sphincter is voluntary in nature, is in the voluntary control and it is innervated by the somatic motor fibers of the pudendal nerve. Now, a more important thing is that the sympathetic nerves to the bladder plays no role in the maturation, but they do mediate the contraction of the bladder muscles that prevents the semen from entering the bladder at the time of ejaculation. These are the innervation of the bladder, the nerve innervation of the bladder. Now, the higher control of the maturation reflex include the facilitatory areas, including the pontine region and the posterior hypothalamus, and the inhibitory area including the midbrain. Also remember the bladder can be made to contract by the voluntary facilitation of the spinal voiding reflex when it contains only a few ml of urine. The voluntary contraction of the abdominal muscle uh, aids the expulsion of the urine by increasing the intra-abdominal pressure. But voiding can be initiated without straining when the bladder is nearly full. Now the automatic blader, what is automatic blader? As the name says, automatic. So what happens? After a few days to weeks of spinal injury that has deprived the micturation reflex of the higher center, the reflex activity starts returning. And during this phase, the blader fills to a threshold and then empties to a considerable extent as a result of blader contraction without any voluntary control. Hence, it is an automatic blader. Now, what is atonic blader? In the atonic blader, the blader is flaccid and relaxed all the time. It is seen for a few days or weeks following the lesion in the neuraxis that interrupts the control of the brain stem and higher centers on the sacral segment concerned with the micturation reflex. It is a state of shock when the spinal cord is suddenly deprived of the regulation from the higher centers and as because of all this, an atonic blader keeps on filling till it cannot contain any more urine. Then it forces a little urine out of the urethra passively, known as the overflow incontinence. The next is a neurogenic bladder. Bladder over here is irritable and empties small quantities of urine at time repeatedly. It is unable to control the onset of the maturation satisfactorily. It occurs due to the incomplete destruction of some of the neural pathways. Now, what will happen and why if urinary bladder is completely denervated? What will happen? It is produced when both the efferent as well as the efferent nerves to the bladder are destroyed as seen in the tumors of corda equina or phylum terminale. The bladder is distended and flaccid for a while. 
Gradually, however, the muscles of the decentralized bladder becomes active with many contraction waves that expel dribbles of urine out of the bladder. The bladder wall becomes shrunken and the bladder wall hypertrophic. The hyperactive state seen in this condition suggests the development of denervation hypersensitivity even though the neuron disrupted are preganglionic rather than postganglionic. Now, what are the tests for the glomerular filtration? So, inulin clearance, creatinine clearance, measurement of the renal blood flow and the renal plasma flow. Measurement of the renal plasma flow is done by using the clearance value of deodorized and para-amino hippuric acid. Also, measurement of the filtration fraction is done. So, these are the normal values of them. Now, what is systematogram and systometry? Systometry is a test used to look for problems with the filling and the emptying of the bladder. Now, over here, the relation between the intravesical pressure and the volume in the bladder. Remember, relation between the intravesical pressure and the volume in the bladder is studied. Now, what happens? How we do this? Over here, a catheter is inserted into the bladder and the bladder is emptied by using this catheter. Now, uh, after this, the intravesical pressure is recorded while the bladder is filled with 50 ml increments of the water. Now, this graph is called as a systometrogram, the graph which is plotted between the intravesical pressure and the volume of the fluid. So, the graph is the systometrogram. So, yeah, that's all for today. In the next part, that is part 4th, I will be discussing about the gastrointestinal system. So that's it for today. I hope you found this video helpful. Thank you so much.